You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, PJ Team Leader, former Indoc Instructor Supervisor, Entrepreneur, and Physician Assistant, Brian Silva. What's up, everybody? Brian Silva for the Ones Ready Podcast. You're in the team room again. And like always, we have a special guest. Every guest that we have is always special because every single person that comes on the show is willing to put the time forth in order to make us better and you guys better. You know, it's a privilege to be able to do this uh, podcast and be able to interview people like who we're going to interview today, Dr. Doug Kajijian. Um, you know, we'll get into that a little bit in a second. I'll let him introduce himself and everything. And I'll say the stuff about himself that he doesn't want to say because it's pretty awesome. And most of us are pretty humble and Doug's, you know, one of those kind of guys. So, um, you know, first I want to say thank you to all of you guys for following us and liking and, you know, just engaging with us. Um, you know, we don't really get paid any money for this at all right now. Um, and we do it for you guys because we want to make sure, make sure the career field is awesome. And we get awesome replacements for us whenever we're done with this gig, um, you know, and pass down all the wisdom and knowledge, what very little bit we have, um, you know, to you guys, make sure you guys can, uh, continue to prosper and, you know, be who you want to be. So that being said, um, you know, I just want to say thanks after, you know, three years ago, I started how to be a PJ and we did, you know, I really didn't think it was going to take off and I didn't know what the market was like, but you know, I love the community and I wanted to go and start doing that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, to this day, we still get guys that are doing the workout programs and they are, um, you know, top of their class in phase two in, um, any of the selections. Um, so, you know, it's pretty awesome that I've been able to impact the, the community with how to be a PJ and now with the ones ready podcast and all the work that everyone else has been putting in to make sure that this is a successful thing. And we're able to help you guys in a big way. So, you know, we appreciate that. And along with that, our partners, you know, at ones ready.com, um, partners link. So go ahead and check that out. Um, so we're going to get into Doug, like we're, like I was talking about. So he is the founder of resilient performance therapy and this clientele for him he's trained everyone from major league baseball to nba to the x games summer olympics there's a whole list here that i got just basically any major league and any major type of um, sporting event he's helped train them and get them back up to speed because that's how uh, good he is at his job so we brought him on here just to make sure that you guys have that kind of knowledge available to you we're going to be talking about some of the common injuries that you guys would be facing while you're training for the pipeline or while you're in the pipeline and then afterward when you're older guys like us and how you uh, can prevent you know some of the aches and pains that we had to go through so um doug if you don't mind just uh introducing yourself yeah well first of all thanks guys for having me i've done quite a few podcasts, including my own, but this one is unique because I have a lot of respect for the audience. I mean, I just turned 40 in July and I remember whatever it was like 22 years ago or actually 18 years ago, kind of being in the position where I was devouring everything I could on the internet, trying to learn about what at the time the indoctrination course was like and how to prepare for that. Um, and thanks to a lot of the great information on the internet, I think I was more prepared than I would have been otherwise. And that's obviously evolved into what you guys are doing right now. And I know that the selection has changed a little bit, but resources like yours are really important. And I think that I owe a lot of the success that I had to people like you and the mentorship that you provided. So thank you for that. And it afforded me um, an amazing career in life. I spent 13 years in the Air Force as a PJ. So the entire time I was in the Air Force, I was a PJ, uh, joined a, a guard unit out of New York, and I grew up in the New York area. So once I kind of researched Pat Rescue, learned about the, uh, the Guard Reserve and how you could actually join with a specific unit. So it was a job that had great appeal. The fact that there was a unit an hour from where I grew up made it kind of a, a no-brainer. Um, so spent 13 years as a PJ between active duty and, and part-time service. Um, was an amazing experience. I mean, I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast knows for the most part what the job entails. So I don't need to sell it. But made some just amazing friends, lifelong relationships, including, I mean, like Aaron, for example, and I, we deployed together. It's probably over 10 years ago to this point. And oh, yeah. you know, for 
Yeah. We probably over the course of the past couple of years, like exchanged some emails and some texts, but I mean, I, I could, I could look at them and it's like, it's like it was in, in Iraq at, uh, at Bilal, like nothing ever, you know, nothing ever happened. Like the clock never ticked. And that, that's, yeah, I, that's kind of the nature of this job and, and this career. Um, so did 13 years and naturally people, people probably asking, you know, why did you get out? I ended up while I was, while I switched from full-time, uh, guard service to part-time, went to physical therapy school to get my physical therapy license and credential. Um, and for a while I was able to go to school and even have my own practice and, and do both things. And then it became difficult, even, even in the guard, you know, the expectation is that you're going to be very, very proficient. It's not like probably some other jobs in the military where there might be a degradation between like the guard and the active duty. Like you're doing the same deployment cycles, you're covering the same sites. And the expectation is that you're going to perform and meet that standard. So even as a part-timer, whether it was a deployment year, non-deployment year, I was probably doing, you know, three to four months a year of training or TDYs, deployments, that kind of thing. It just became very difficult running my own business to do both. So it wasn't that like I I still love the job and the work. It was just difficult to kind of do both things. And you know, when you run your own business, you realize the, the opportunity cost of going away from military service. Um, and so as my own boss, I was kind of like, since I already made this commitment to do this physical therapy job, um, you know, I, I didn't think it was made a ton of sense to continue being a part-time PJ, but there's things about it that I miss every day. Um, and you know, so it's still an amazing experience. And I, uh, don't regret doing it for a second. 13 years really flew by. So that's kind of where I'm at now. Like I said, was a PJ for 13 years. Uh, went to physical therapy school while I was still in the service. Started a physical therapy practice in New York City with my two partners. And now we have a location in New York City, a location in New Jersey. And then we do some consulting and educational stuff, whether it's for like collegiate teams, professional teams, and even a little bit with um, the military and some federal law enforcement groups. So I think that it was kind of a a little bit of a seamless fit because obviously pararescue and, and Air Force Special Operations is a very physical job. I always had an interest, even in, in undergrad when I was in college. At the time, I thought I wanted to go to medical school and went as far as you know doing the pre-med requirements, took the MCATs. And then my senior year of medical school, of, of undergrad, I found that about pararescue. And I was kind of like, whoa, this is a special operations type job that has you know the physical and psychological challenge that you know kind of appeals to other special operations units. But the emphasis was on medical and technical rescue, which appealed to me a lot more. Not that like I didn't like some of the other jobs, but I think what makes pararescue unique is that medical and technical rescue emphasis. So the more I kind of learned about it and researched it, again, partially through you know websites and resources like your own, the more intrigued I was. And I just decided that I, you know, I could always go back to school um, and, and, and get the credential in medicine, but it was a job that I felt like if I didn't do it, I would have regretted not doing it. And now that I've, <laughs> it's that 20 years later, I'm glad that I did it. So, and then I ended up doing physical therapy. I know you guys wanted me to get into that because I felt like it was kind of a nice hybrid between doing something medical, but also something training and more physical. Like in sports medicine, you can go the, the surgical route, the primary care route. And I think those are, are great jobs. I just didn't necessarily want to be doing surgeries and even the primary care. Like I like the idea of having a longer term relationship with a patient or an athlete and incorporating some of the, the preventative and the wellness side of things. And you don't get that when you're a surgeon or even like a, um, a primary care physician, because at that point it's your job mostly to try to reverse and fix pathology. And I just like the idea of kind of the preventative and the, the training and aspect and like more continuum between training and rehab, not just waiting until somebody's really debilitated. And then you have to either like surgically repair something or, you know, give people medication to try to, uh, calm the problem down. Yeah. And we, we deal with questions about injuries and how hard should I train and, you know, what are the risks if I, if I overtrain and stuff, I can't wait for you to lay that out in your, in your experience in this space, because man, there's, there's really nobody better. Like you've seen both sides of the fence. You've seen and felt the way that you need to break your body down. And you've seen now how you can help people prepare for that and then keep themselves going, especially later in life. But I did want to highlight something here. I even jumped in just so I could get this one out there, but you highlighted something that it's really hard for us to explain. But when you first started talking, you said, you know, Aaron, you and I deployed together 10 years ago. The first thing that we did when we opened up this podcast is you and I laughed about a dumb joke we made in <laughs> a chow hall every really day. Dumb. Like, yeah. Really? It was the dumbest. <laughs> it's like, it, it's yeah. like, it, it is, but it's one of those things like people, that is why we do this. Yep. It's because a brother that I haven't seen for 10 years, he and I jump back into old jokes and old tricks right away. Like that's what aspect war is and the larger soft component. 
it doesn't matter that Doug has moved on to his job, you know, as a doctor and, and physical therapy and all of those things in the space that we're going to talk about, or that Brian is a PA now, or that Trent is about to get fired from his job for being generally <laughs> terrible at it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. Like we can just hop back into that. That's an intangible that, you know, I think we all share and it, you know, it's, it's something that we, we all dig. So I just wanted to say that's, that's an awesome thing that you yeah, brought it's, up. It's the and, best part and, of the job. Yep. Yeah, it really is. See, and I'm just over here waiting for the, the first guest to come on and be like, it totally wasn't worth it. I <laughs> right, regret yeah. being part of this community. <laughs> <laughs> like as soon as you start saying that, I'm like, well, he's not the one, I guess I'm going right. to wait Sorry for the to next guest. You guys. Yeah. Another one bites the dust. Yeah, it's, it's, it's coming. Uh, so let, let's jump into the, the physical therapy side of the house, if you don't mind. And, sure. and as a longtime instructor, I have not seen more cone tears shed over any other issue than uh, shin splints. And as an instructor, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> shin splints, they're fake. And then it's just a way for students to get out of training. Could you explain Shin splints to me? are fake news. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, can it's, you explain it's a good question because, you know, shin splints is kind of a vague term. I mean, that whole, like anything, and a lot of things in medicine, it's a continuum. Like there's, there's some things with our background, right, in trauma medicine where it's like, all right, you broke your femur, you broke your pelvis, a blood vessel has been damaged. That's like very tangible. And that's why in a lot of ways, trauma is kind of, intellectually very easy because you just have to kind of plug holes and put tubes in people to breathe and that kind of thing and reverse damage, right? But medical things tend to be much more, like I said, of a continuum. So with shin splints, I mean, it's this umbrella term that can cover anything from like a, a tendinopathy in some of the muscles in the, in the lower leg or even kind of stress reactions. And even with a stress reaction, right? Like that's its own continuum because someone can have like a hot spot in their shin and it's diagnosed as shin splints, but a lot of times, you know, because the early stress reactions are hard to detect on imaging, um, they're they're written off as shin splints when it's really kind of you're you're on the path to a stress fracture and maybe ultimately a fracture if you don't change what you're doing. Um, but so as far as like, I think the, what you're probably getting at is like, all right, how do we prevent it or how do we deal with it? And I'll I'll start by being kind of evasive, but then I'll, I'll be specific and, and not evasive. <laughs> Like oh, you play else. coy all yeah. you want. Yeah. You play coy all you want. You <laughs> right. play hard to get on this diagnosis. That's you fine. Fit, you fit in here. Yeah. And, and, and so with, you know, with shin splints or anything, you guys are going to ask me, I'm probably going to say, well, it, it depends on the totality of, of what you're doing. So a lot of times people want to know, like, they don't want to change what they're doing or really like analyze their process. So they'll say like, I have shin splints. What's the will foam rolling help or what's the one stretch that I can do? And it's like, if you're, and you guys know this, right? If your programming is not sound, then it doesn't matter. You can't just like add something in and expect to reverse it. Now, sometimes you can get lucky and like maybe, you know, if you, if you have good therapy available, like you get some, you know, manual therapy or you get whatever kind of, you know, treatment tends to work for you like that, that can buy you some time and buy you some relief. I think that with running, there's, there's a couple of variables. So the first one is, this is the easiest one, and probably for people in my field, the one that they agree on the most, because I think in my field, there's some internal debates on, like, should people run? Does, does it matter how somebody runs, like their foot strike pattern? And the one thing people universally agree upon is if you increase your mileage too, too rapidly, and that can happen, right, like in a selection course where if you're coming, say, from, like, I think it's changed since I went through that process. But like in basic training, we really didn't run that much. There was no, like they didn't separate like the AFSOC candidates from everybody else. So we ran, like I ran the same amount as somebody who's going to have a sedentary job. Uh, I was in a different running group, but as far as the amount that I did was probably the same. So, and then you go to like Indoc at the time and you're running a lot more and that, that spike in your workload can predispose you to some of these shin splints type presentations. So and, and you guys are probably pretty savvy on like making sure that you gradually increase your mileage so that there isn't a big spike in what they call like the, the uh, acute to, or the chronic to acute workload ratio. So your chronic workload being like what you, the sum of, of what you've consistently done over the last couple of weeks, couple of months. And then if you have a huge spike in your acute workload, that's when you can get some of these, whether it's tendinopathy, stress reactions. So that's, that's probably like the lowest hanging fruit. Then there's an, this is where it's a little bit more contentious as far as my field. I mean, I, I, I feel confident in saying that I think that like anything else, how you do something matters. I don't think that all strategies are 
created equal. So I think that there are, relatively speaking, better and worse ways to run, but there's also some nuance involved. So like when it comes to distance running, and that's going to be the bulk of the kind of training that you're going to do in these courses, um, there are elite endurance athletes, distance runners, like for example, who run with the heel strike. There's elite distance runners who run with more of a midfoot or a forefoot strike. But what you don't really see in, in good runners who are able to tolerate high workloads is like a massive, massive overstride. So like there is a heel strike and then there is a massive overstride of the heel strike. And, you know, if I'm working with some, I'm biased because the people that I work with, like the runners, they're coming to me because they're hurt. So I'm probably more likely to kind of want to want to modify their gait pattern or their running pattern and look at it. But what, what a lot of physical therapists, they don't want to make a definitive statement and say, well, like be judgmental and say, well, there's no, they don't want to say there's good and bad ways to run because I think it's kind of like just a greater trend that we see in society where nobody wants to be kind of judgmental and definitive. So, but what they will definitively say is, okay, um, like people who have running related injuries, one of the better ways to, to, to improve that is to increase their cadence. So that's a roundabout way of saying, if you increase somebody's cadence, you're, I want to shorten their stride. Let, I want to, I want to force like, them to have their knee turnover has to be faster. Those right. whole mechanics that so immediately so, stops. Totally. So they're kind of talking out of both sides of their mouth because they don't want to say that like a, like, let's say like a midfoot strike is better than a rear foot strike, but they'll say, if you, if you have a running related problem, you should increase your cadence. Now you can increase your cadence and go from a, a massive overstride and heel strike to a less pronounced heel strike. So you're still heel striking, but there's still a difference between those two things. Um, so what we tend, what we, and a lot of the tendinopathy research will say that like the compressive loads on a tendon, whether it's like your hamstring tendon or your posterior tibialis tendon, and that's a lot of times like shin splints is posterior, uh, uh, tendon, posterior tibial tendinopathy, you know, in disguise is really like what they'll call shin splints. A lot of the time, well, if you have a massive overstride, now your, your foot's going to spend more time on the ground because your cadence is lower. That's more time for you to, and again, pronation is not a bad thing. Pronation, pronation is a natural motion of the foot. It's a shock. It's required for shock absorption. But if you pronate a lot, now that posterior tibial tendon is going to be under more compression. You're more likely that tends to be the mechanism for tendinopathy. So if you reduce your stride, there's going to be less compression on that tendon. And the analogy you can use is because we all do or did rope rescue. It's kind of like if you're moving a rope through a pulley, or imagine if you have a rope that's moving over an edge, that's the same thing that happens to a lot of joints at end range. You're getting compression between the rope and the edge or compression between the bony prominence and the tendon. And so running in more of a mid range position, i.e. less of an overstride tends to reduce some of those compressive loads on the tendon. And it also allows you to kind of take advantage of some of the elastic mechanisms in the foot and ankle complex. So, which again, can reduce the risk of injury and reduce some of the impact forces, or at least the, 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 the spike in the impact forces and the slope of the impact forces. So again, I'm not, I'm not saying definitively that like, if you run with a heel strike, you should switch to a midfoot strike. I'm not one of these crazy people who's like, you should run bare feet or you should take your supportive shoes and all of a sudden just switch to a zero drop shoe because that creates its own set of problems. But I think that there, as far as the continuum of running goes, running with a massive overstride, I think can be problematic, especially in a program like an AFSOC selection program where you're going to be running and spending a lot of time on your feet. So I can send you guys like a, a resource that, that we have that just kind of goes over like what we would look for if we were working with a running athlete. And it's just an example. I'm not saying everyone should try to mimic the after video of the, of the athlete we're going to use in our presentation. But um, I think that, you know, so it comes down to the, the biggest things are your, your mileage and your programming and programming is always going to kind of rain supreme that's like the number one thing and then if someone's just if someone's chronically injured and and, and even with sound programming or what appears to be sound programming they still have problems with these shin splints types presentations then i might do more of a gait analysis and try to like you know short increase the cadence or shorten the stride and you can however that changes the foot strike pattern it's going to change it probably to a lesser heel strike or more towards a a midfoot strike but um and then beyond that like this is more of like a medical thing, but making sure that, you know, you see this more like in female athletes, but because of the, the energy expenditure in a selection course, making sure people are getting adequate caloric intake, they don't have any bone density issues 
again, you don't see that as much in the kind of population that we're addressing here, but it, it, it can be something to look into if you've tried everything else to include those like first two things, programming and gate analysis, and people are still still injured. So I would say those three things. And that's why, again, it, it comes down to what's the totality of what you're doing, because you know people will often say, and I know that like Aaron's a big proponent of strength training. Um, it's not that like, I mean, it may have changed since I've been in, but like when I went to Indoc, like we didn't lift weights, we weren't tested on it. And I know that the, the PT test has changed and now they do incorporate like some, some strength training movements into it. But even, even if you were never going to be tested on it, I think there is an important role for strength training with distance athletes and endurance athletes because it's going to increase your bone density. I think it gives you kind of a bigger sort of physiological buffer to handle, handle stress. So a lot of the, like the distance and endurance athletes I work with, one of the first things I'll do if they don't do any strength training is I'll say, okay, like let's incorporate one or two days a week of strength training because that's going to kind of give you the physiological and orthopedic capacity to handle the amount of running you're doing. So it's not that like I care, I don't care how much like a high level, you know, distance runner can deadlift per se. Deadlifting is just a means to, to an end as far as like, this is going to support the thing that you care about. But if they don't do any, any strength training, then I think they're leaving some potential and possibly some training volume on the, on the table. And training volume is what allows them to get better at their sport. Yeah, I think, I think we've all seen that, felt that ourselves, you know, if you're, if you're too far on one side or the other. Yeah. But while that was a very simple and uh, concise answer, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Also, uh, but for like all complex. the <laughs> Doug, did, did you did you just cancel shin splints? Did, did you just definitively the, the, put this to bed? I'm a, so I'm they're a big fake. fan of cancel culture. So we're gonna cancel. Yeah. Shin so they're splints. fake. Do some calf raises, donkey calf raises, like the picture of Arnold with uh, uh, oh Lou Ferrigno and somebody else on his back doing donkey calf raises, and we're all gonna be good. I, but you know what? You joke about that. But like, I, I'll say one change that I've made professionally in the last couple of years is there was a movement, you know, in strength and conditioning and fitness where it was like you had to do like only multi-joint movements, functional training, any kind of like, you can't isolate a muscle totally, but any kind of like uni-joint action was considered bad. And now Mm -hmm. like what we're seeing is a lot of people have knee problems. Like if you have, like especially coming off say an ACL surgery, if you don't isolate the quad and do things like leg extensions, well, if you go to a multi-joint movement, you can compensate around that and you can use a hip or an ankle strategy to make up for what you lack in knee strength. And so even for some of these lower leg things, like, you know, I do get, have people do calf races where I, I might not have done it five years ago because it, it's the only way to specifically target that, that weak area. And you're not going to get that by doing like squats and deadlifts. Like those are great exercises, but they're not going to target what could be a weak, a weak link in the chain. So yes, get people on your back at the gym and do donkey calf raises. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Louis. And just was. <laughs> One thing before we move on from this, can we can we define overstride? Is that just your foot uh, extending beyond your knee during your stride? Is yeah, that I mean, so again, like, th- there's probably a technical definition. Like I'm more, there's a lot of, I'm sure like a researcher has a specific criteria as far as like how far does your foot land in front of the center of mass. So there's probably a technical thing. Like if it's a certain distance or angle, that's what constitutes overstriding. I mean, if you look at like a sprinter, you know, cause sprinting is different than distance running, but not that different sprinters. The good ones tend to land with their foot either slightly in front or like just under their center of mass in a distance in distance running, you can get away with not doing that. You can still propel yourself forward. Um, like, so in, in walking, I mean, walking is different than running in that in walking, there's always a point at which one foot's in contact with the ground and running there's, you have a flight phase. So when I talk about overstriding, I'm not using, I'm not saying it like in a technical way, like where it's a certain angle or distance in front of your center of mass. I'm just saying that if you look at somebody and it's almost like they're running, like they're walking on an elliptical, where they're just, it's like they're, they never get like any kind of knee bend and they're just like reaching for the ground at foot contact. It's very obvious when you see it. And in the video that I'll send you guys, it'll be more apparent, but it's kind of like, even if you have no training in physical therapy, biomechanics, an untrained person can look at good and bad runners and like they can tell like okay like that person's probably better at, at running it just it has a certain aesthetic to it and, and a certain kind of cadence and rhythm and the more like i said you the more you land with that foot out in front of your center of mass the less athletic and aesthetically pleasing and the less rhythmic it looks so i'm just looking for like i'm looking for extremes right like if someone's a good runner they're never hurt 
and they run with a heel strike or a slight overstride, no big deal. But it's the person that's like either really slow and never gets faster or the person that's always hurt. And they have this massive overstride where they're like, you know, a foot in front of their center of mass when at foot contact. That's kind of what I'm talking about. And it almost looks halting. It almost looks yeah. like their momentum is stopped when you overstride. It almost looks like you hit the ground too hard with that heel way forward. And you're like, it just doesn't look right. And then you look at somebody that, you know, you look at the recent marathon winners that can glide at a 445 mm-hmm. to five minute pace for 24 <laughs> miles, 26 miles. And you're like, wow, that looks effortless, like effortless. It, they're, they're just gliding through life. They've got nice, quiet shoulders. Yeah. And that's, so, I mean, this is like, just to, to piggyback on that. It's physics, right? So everyone here is going to take the ASVAB if they're trying to go into pararescue. High school physics. If you land with your foot way out in front, exactly what Aaron said, you're running with a braking force because I'll, I'll do the video here. Like if I'm landing with my foot like that, the ground's going to push back in the opposite direction with an equal magnitude. That's the ground reaction force. So if I've got a ground reaction force that's going at a diagonal, you're going to have a vertical component to that force and a horizontal. So if I'm running and I'm trying to go one way, I don't want to produce forces or have the ground produce forces that oppose the direction I want to run. That's why when you watch like a baseball player running down the first baseline, when they want to slow down, they reach with their foot. That's the braking. So most people don't run like that extreme when they're running for distance. But again, the more out in front you are, the more you actually are braking and kind of slowing yourself down when you run. Got it. Makes total sense. To quote Jesse Pinkman from the famous series Breaking Bad, that's just science, bitch. That's right. That's all yeah. that is. Hashtag That's science. Is. Yep. Hashtag science. So let's let's bridge the gap here because we do some things like our movement patterns are not the same. So typically you have a you, if you're looking at like your the most basic movement patterns on the face of the planet, right? You're looking at a hinge, you're looking at a squat, you're looking at a push, you're looking at a pull, and you're looking at maybe a carry. We do a lot of carries and specifically we rock a ton. So when we, people have these minor inconsistencies, when you have a runner that really isn't good, they don't understand where they're supposed to be in their personal space. The easiest way to screw that up, it's just like free fall jumping. If you have the most minor inconsistency in your arms, when you're slick, you put a ruck on that minor inconsistency is going to be through the roof. What are some common things that you see with rucking form different than running that you would like to just put out there right now. If you're like, listen, if you do one thing, when you ruck to change it up, do this. Hmm. I mean, that, that's good. So, I mean, maybe obvious, but like, make sure that your pack is on properly. So there are people who like, don't even know how to use like, don't the even weight, know how the to weight, pack a the waist belt. They don't know how to distribute the weight in their ruck. So, you know, like, especially people who are training for this kind of thing, oftentimes, like when we wore a ruck on an operational mission, we had to stuff a bunch of stuff in there. So typically the weight would be distributed in such a way that it kind of made sense. But like, if you're saying, okay, I want to train for selection and I've got this empty Alice pack and I want to weigh it down, people will take like a, you know, a 40 pound kettlebell and throw it at the bottom. Well, that's not just random stuff. That's, that's the that's worst, the worst good, that you could right? possibly do. Yeah. Yeah. So trying to get the weight distributed in like in a ruck, if you're, if you're, if you're going to like throw a kettlebell in a ruck, put a couple of towels or some sweatshirts at the bottom of the ruck so that it sits up a little bit higher. So that's kind of like less of a, a torque essentially, um, on your body. And then, you know, I think a lot of times, um, people, when they ruck, you don't want to have like the, the, like the, the heavy hands walker, like arm swing where you're like overdoing it. But a lot of times people don't rotate their trunk at all or, or move their arms when they ruck. And I think that can create some problems because like you, you need, you need to rotate through your trunk to have a good, efficient gait pattern. Um, so, but I think that like, honestly, ruck, ruck fit is probably the number one thing. Cause rucking is really just walking. But the other thing is I think a lot of times people, frankly, and this is where the strength training comes in again, you need to have some amount of like pillar strength or just lower body and, 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 and midline strength to be able to, to ruck well. And so that's why doing things like carries, I think are great deadlifts and squats, because like, if you're really weak and you have to do a 70 pound ruck movement, like that, no matter how good your aerobic conditioning is, like when you run and I could tell you like, Hey, swing your arms when you ruck, like you're not going to do it. Cause you just can't handle that kind of load. So ideally, you know, if you can, like, if you can do carries and maybe in my ideal world, I would like to see anybody in like this line of work, probably be able to do like a double their body weight, like carry where they like pick up a trap bar and then walk with it. So now you can do a double your body weight deadlift walk around with it. So now you've got the grip strength, kind of the core strength, the lower body strength to 
probably handle anything that you encounter on the job. If you can do that, then you're probably going to rock a lot better because 70 pounds is going to be, you know, like a very small percentage of what your body is capable of handling from an external load standpoint. This is why people who like only do endurance type work kind of are in for a rude awakening when they go, when they go and ruck. And it's my understanding that they're they're incorporating a lot more rucking into the early phases of selection now. So if that's the case, like you don't want to show up never having rucked before, because if you haven't done it, it's going to rock your world. Now I will say that if you have really good, you know, just decent relative strength levels and you can handle external load and you're a good runner, rucking probably won't be that difficult. Um, but I think that again, there's a strength component to this and not that people have to be like trained like power lifters or Olympic weightlifters, but if you're not doing some strength training, then rucking is really going to suck because like I said, if someone can carry around double their body weight in a farmer's walk, when they put a 70 pound ruck on, like, yeah, it's not, it's not fun, but that's not going to be like a debilitating type of a load. Right. Yeah. It's not the worst. So I, I don't think I fit in with your like moderately strong, moderately good running profile, but I've always considered myself to be a good rucker. I've done the baton death march three times. We yeah. did it. Um, military heavy category, 50, 50 pounds dry every time. So I've got some time under a ruck. Um, and I trained for that as well. Some of the, some of the actually more challenging physical events I did were rucks that were planning to go do that event. So, um, awesome event. There were two areas that I, that always were the worst and I could never figure over it. Like it took me an extra day or two to recover. It's right in between my shoulder blades and it's at the, at my lower back, just from the angle. It's like hip flexors is a close third is kind of, cause you're kind of like bent over a little bit more. You have to give the ruck a little bit input. You have to kind of walk a little yeah. bit downhill with the ruck. Can you give us just your quick hits, a couple for in the middle of your shoulder blades? Like how do I prehab those areas? How do I rehab those areas? So before and after the event, and then what does recovery look like? Should I be rucking every day? Should I give it a day in between? Is it like running? Is it a supplement? What are your views on it? Yeah, it's good. And so I would say that as far as like how to, it's totally normal to not feel great after you ruck. Like there's some things that no matter what you do, like you can have the best preparation and scheme in the world. Like doing a baton death march, like your back and stuff is going to be sore afterwards. I will, right. I will try to find this picture, but my friend, Chris, yeah. you know, Chris Sobel, right? Yeah. Same time as you. So Chris did it. Chris and I did it. There's a very, uh, there's a picture between he and I that we reference quite frequently as how physically crushed you can be. We were driving home from white sands missile range to Kirtland and we had IVs hung up in the bag of his Audi. Our feet were hamburger. We could barely walk in the house like that yeah. event. There, there's a backstory to that one. Maybe we'll hit it up on story time, but rucking sometimes events like that, especially if you're talking about doing a soft sand ruck, if you're talking about doing an off-road or a mountain ruck, like the mountain rucks out at, at, in Kirtland or, you know, you get up to the Pacific Northwest, like that's no joke. Those, those vertical changes are, are no joke. So yeah, rucking is completely different than just taking a run. Yeah. And uh, rucking is the foundation of soldiering. I mean, throughout like the course of history, that's a common denominator. And, and the only, I mean, let's be honest, like if you have to go to a selection course and running is, is one of the tests, then you should run because you're not getting to the show unless you pass the test. But I mean, I personally don't see a huge role for distance running once you're an operator. I think there's like, there's more, there's ways to develop aerobic fitness that have more of a job carryover and probably less orthopedic stress. But to answer your question about after, you know, what you would do like after a ruck, I mean, I think that's where there's a place for, for doing mobility work. and. Uh, like I, I'll personally after like a hard ruck because I still do some of that stuff. I do some ski mountaineering. Like as much get as it. as much as when you're yeah. as much as you don't want to do anything else when you get home, you just want to like get into a hot tub <laughs> or whatever or lay on the couch. I'll do some mobility work and some staples for me. And again, I could send you guys some links. Like if you go to the Resilient Performance Physical Therapy YouTube, I'll do a variant of what's called the couch stretch. I'll do a variant of what's called the inchworm. So when I do that, now I'm getting like. I'm getting my quads. I'm getting my the whole front line of my my leg there. So I'm getting my you know anterior tibialis anterior. I'm getting my foot into end range plantar flexion. And then with the inchworm, I'm getting the opposite. I'm getting my lower back to relax. I'm getting my calves to relax. I mean, and there's some again debate about like what does stretching like really do? Am I am I claiming that by doing that I'm I'm creating like a a permanent change in my muscle tissue qualities? No, but like it does feel good and when you're, when you're rucking for hours on end, that's just like <laughs> hours of, of compression and your body kind of tightening down. And so I, I like to, before I kind of like move on to whatever I'm going to do next in the day, 
have the last thing that my body remembers from a training standpoint to be something where I'm like just trying to get into some more elongated positions so that, you know, kind of like the last snapshot my body had training that day was doing something that wasn't like through a limited range of motion. Um, I think that the older you get, the more of that work you have to do for like upper back. I mean, something as simple as actually hanging from a bar. Now, if you hang from the bar, from a bar and you like lift your knees up to just above 90 degrees, a couple of really deep breaths, get your like upper back to expand, like your back will feel and shoulder blades will feel a lot better again, because like when you ruck to counter, you know, that weight and stay upright against gravity, you're probably going to have to like pull your shoulders back and be a little bit retracted. And so your spinal erectors and your back is just constantly in that extended position. And even if you, even if you are rounded over, your body still has to fight that by, by trying to counter it. So you might look like you're flexed over, but your back is still working really hard to counter, to counter gravity and that external load. So something as simple as like hanging from a bar, you could even do it with your feet supported. Um, and then even something like a, um, another variant that we like for that is, um, if you go to, again, the resilient performance, physical therapy, YouTube channel, if you type in rock back on elbows, it's basically a modified child's pose from yoga where you're in like a fully flexed position, like a cannonball, but instead of your arms being overhead, you're putting your elbows just outside your knees. You're pushing through your elbows to kind of round your upper back to just kind of like decompress that space. Again, take a couple of really deep breaths, expand that upper back, and it'll reduce a lot of that tone that you probably will have kind of developed over the course of that ruck. And so these are just examples, right? But I, I would say that like, as soon as you, you finish your training for that day, you're going into your recovery mode. Like one of the things that you, you can do to facilitate recovery is to do some of these mobility type things. And then if you, if you like it, I mean, foam rolling, most people will foam roll like before they work out. I think you're probably better off if you're going to do it and time is limited, do it after a really hard training event. Like I personally, I don't do a ton of it. I just think there's probably better uses of, of time if time is, you know, uh, is, um, is limited. But if, you're, if you like foam rolling and you feel like you get benefit from it, probably do it afterwards unless you're just so restricted that you need to foam roll before before you train to like hit better positions and then you know like if you have access to it like if you are you know on an operational unit like getting regular soft tissue work and stuff like that can be very helpful too but i'm guessing that the people that are you know listening to this podcast probably don't have those resources available so there's still plenty of things that you can do do on your own but i would say like when you're done with what you perceive as the difficult part of your training as much as it's monotonous and boring, doing a little bit of mobility work and finding the areas that maybe that for you feel like they get tight the next day, like do something to, you know, to address those before you kind of move on with your day after you train. Right. And I think that's a huge thing that you just said, because obviously I see patients all the time and they're like, my back's not getting better. My back's not getting better. I went to physical therapy and it's just not getting better. It's like, okay, what did you obviously they taught you some stuff. How often are you actually doing those things yeah. at home that they're teaching you? Are you just going to the class and expecting them to just give you a tune up like a, like a Jiffy Lube or whatever. And then you decide that, you know, I'm good to go. I'm uh, I went to my, my Jiffy Lube. I got and, an oil change. I don't yeah, need to I'm, get an oil change again. I already got it changed once. Well, exactly. yeah, but this audience, this will resonate this analogy. It's, it's weapons maintenance, basically. I mean, think of it as if you go to the, go to the range and you shoot a couple hundred rounds, like you, you clean your gun immediately when you get back. So people are going to mm -hmm. say, oh, that's a crude analogy. People aren't machines. And if, and and like, if you clean get, it when yeah. it's warm, it gets cleaner. If you right. clean it closer to the event, yeah. you can actually clean it and actually maintain right. it better. It'll shoot better the next time if yeah. you clean it when it's warm. Like, and yes, I get people aren't machines and they're not guns, but it's, it's an analogy, right? Like, you know, when, when, when a helicopter lands after a training mission or a real mission, like it immediately goes to maintenance for the, the post-flight inspection and they get it ready for the next day when we go out on a mission and we use all of our team gear, like we make sure that we reconstitute all the lift bags and the jaws and the, all our medical gear. It's like, you're not, you're not done until you're really done. So there's things that you can do to kind of set yourself up for success the next day. And it doesn't, I mean, people again, think that they're done. Like, well, I went for my run and it's over. And like, yes, if, if you're 18 years old, maybe you can get away with that, but it's probably a good idea to start developing some good habits, you know, earlier on, because if you don't do that stuff, it does catch up to you. And I think we could probably all, all, <laughs> yeah. all attest to that, right? Yeah, you might not think that you need to do it right now because you can pretty much go to sleep at midnight and wake up at 3 a.m., still go to work and do whatever 
something you got but that doesn't last forever and uh you know just like doug's talking about it just catches up to you um so yeah i think that's super important to realize that you got to put in the work like it's not just over once you're done doing the workout or whatever for whatever program you're doing for the day you're like well i did my last push-up boom ready to go back into sleep mode or watch my show or whatever no it's not over you got to continue to do that maintenance work like he's talking about so i want to switch um from the rucking and that kind of stuff into treading because i think it's really worth mentioning I just, as an instructor, when I was doing my thing over there, I had uh, a lot of people that would fail out for treading and it was totally unnecessary. They just weren't used to the workload. They, a lot of times what we found was just, you know, their hip flexors and their whole uh, hip girdle basically was not as flexible as it needed to be for them to get that rotation and that motion that they needed to be. So, um, can you just, I just want to address that real quick. And, um, if you have any uh, specific thoughts on that, as far as treading for guys that really struggle, obviously there's a coordination component to it and everything, but, um, as far as being able to be flexible enough and that kind of stuff. Yeah. What would you that's a really good question. That, that was actually me. Like I sucked at treading and I could never get the egg beater down. And now knowing what I know, I realize why, because there, there's two reasons why let's say you wouldn't be able to egg beater. One is you lack the, the kind of coordination and the motor pattern. So that's where like, you know, with the right instruction and cueing, you can kind of, you can get somebody to do it with the right drill progression. You know, you, whatever, like, you know, part hole training, you could figure out like, okay, how do we break the, the whole movement down into like its components, master each of the components and then build on it. And, and that's, that's the part that I tried and it didn't work. And what I realized later was like, it, think of it as like hardware and software, the motor control or the, you know, the, the technical cueing, that's kind of your, your software. But if your hardware can't get in the positions for the software to run and then it doesn't matter. So for me, what I realized was like back then I had, not that it's great now, but it's better than it was back then. I had terrible hip mobility. So to be able to egg beater, you have to get your hip into kind of like a goalie in hockey, what's called internal rotation, even though like if you put somebody on their back and you keep their femur stable and you swing their tibia out, it looks like that's external rotation. Your femur is actually, or your hip is internally rotating when you do that. So, but basically it's semantics, but your hip has to be able to internally rotate to egg beater well, because that's how you generate, you know, you're generating force through that range of motion to create a lift force in the water. If you lack that, if you lack that motion, it doesn't matter how good an instructor you have, how good a swim coach, you're never going to be able to do it because your body's not capable of getting into the right, the requisite positions. It's kind of like if you literally, if you had, if your spine was immobilized, you wouldn't be good at free falling because you could have somebody say like, Hey, arch, do all these drills. But if your back is not capable of arching and your pelvis isn't capable of tilting a certain way, you're not going to be able to get in a stable free fall position. So for me, the problem was like, I know it now I, my, I had just terrible hip mobility. So I had to do um, more of like a breaststroke or a frog kick, which as you guys know, is not nearly as efficient because, because I lack so much rotation in my hip. I had to have two legs going at the same time to, to give myself enough, a, a, enough motion through which to create that force in the water. Whereas with the egg beater, you're getting a constant lift force because your legs are, you know, their legs, are, legs are doing different things at the same time. With a frog kick, you kick, you sink, you kick, you sink. Yeah. And so, and that's a dangerous game because you know yeah. you got to keep your earlobes and your wrists above the water at all times. If you're let doing me, this, let me see those. You're just get, like, let me see oh them man, get slightly moist. Let me see them earlobes get just a little bit right. moist. You, you let gotta me see be, what it's happens. Like one of those things. It's like, moist. If you're, you know, you've got to be like really hard. If if your technique sucks, you've got to be really tough and really hard. And like you're better off saving that for when you really need it. You know, not in the pool. So there there are things you can do for that. Again, I'll um, I'll, I'll send you guys a list of videos, some like some hip mobility drills that would be very helpful for that. Um, but you need to be able to get into the position. Like if your hips can't rotate, treading water without using your hands is, is really hard. So again, it comes down to hardware versus software problem. Like if you can, if you, if you have the range of motion detached from the, the task of treading water, if you have that range of motion, then it's not a hardware issue, then it's a software issue. And that's where like doing different, you know, egg beater type drills or progressions will be helpful. But if you don't, if you can't hit those positions, it doesn't matter what somebody tells you, you know, you can look at all the water polo training videos in the world. Like your body just won't get into the position. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And that's why I just want to bring it up. You know, guys just don't realize that it is literally the flexibility, like you're talking about that hardware over software problem that you can't do it no matter. It's not just only your coordination. Now that might be a component of it that you might have to work on, but also you got to be able to actually, you know, get into those positions like he was talking about. Yeah. Um, so the last thing uh, from me before we move on to a different topic is just using these fins. So you guys know these, uh, you got some jet fins right here. So these things right here. These, oh, check have them out. These jet fins. In the last 20 years? They haven't changed <laughs> no, in the last 50 really. years, baby. These are actually yeah, there was, there was a- ATAC fins. I don't know. They're a little bit different. Those ATAC but, officials. But yeah. they, they might have some, some special little spots in the there UDT that help us out. The UDT's in World War II were using the same fins. <laughs> Exactly, 100%. but and those, so were the Germans swimming up them, swimming up them rivers, dog. Yep. Those bad boys right there. If you've never used those kinds of fins, they. I remember like me using it for the first time because I showed up to Indoc and I had never. Wreck they just you. wrecked the bottom of my foot was torn up, the top of my foot was all blistered up, and my calves and everything else was cramping up just from trying to power those bad boys like through the water. You know, I've never had to use that much muscle. Um, you know, those types of muscles, especially the first time. So I think it's kind of a little bit like rucking, you know, for the first time, if you just jump straight into it, you're going to be prone to screwing yourself up. So what kind of tips you got for uh, those guys jumping into that? Yeah. And I mean, I'm guessing that this is not going to contradict what you tell people you, you train. So I, I, my opinion when it comes to swimming and preparing for any of these courses is like, yeah, I think the first day of these courses, you have to do like a, a freestyle swim. That's probably the only time you're going to do it. So I, I look at it like, as long as you can pass that freestyle swim, most of your swim training should be devoted to finning so that when you start going to pre-scuba or whatever, you don't have that huge shock to your system from that big jump in your, um, from your chronic to your acute, uh, acute to chronic workload ratio. It's just like, well, just like with running, I, right? Like, I'm going to pause yeah. you. I'm going to pause you there. Cause we get that question a lot. Like people are like, well, how important is swimming? Listen, when you're in the pool, freestyle swimming or being able to like move from one point to another helps you out in the most minimal sense. Being able to like freestyle swim from event to event to event. Okay, maybe you get an extra 10 seconds of rest yeah. while everybody else is getting to the wall essentially. But the graded event that you're going to go into right. most likely has fins yep. on your feet. Yeah. So yeah. Tr- be specific if you're training for the pass test. you need to have that time that's without fins swimming. The second that you get past the pass test and you're able to maintain that standard, you need to move on to the next thing and that's finning. The only thing, the only caveat that I want to throw out there for guys uh, doing underwaters and stuff like that, especially (gasps) How dare you? you? A caveat, Brian? A caveat? (laughs) Once you get into like uh, BDUs, ABUs, and you're not efficient with your freestyle and you're doing underwaters, you only have like two minutes or so to get back and breathe and that kind of stuff. If you cannot efficiently freestyle with those items of clothing on and get back to the wall, you're pretty much starting as soon as you get back to the wall on your next underwater and that kills you. So that's the only thing. Yeah, and I agree. I'm not saying don't don't freestyle at all. I think that some people just like, they think they're just going to go there and pick up the finning and like if you're fit, that won't be the issue because it's just it's kicking with in the water. But it's from an injury standpoint, preparing your lower leg for that stress. I mean, if you think about what a fin does, a fin basically just makes your foot longer. It's like it, it, it extends your toes, but now your muscles in your lower leg that are used to moving around these little toes now have to move around this huge lever. And it's just a lot more stress on that lower leg. And it's a lot more tension and torque that has to be generated through some of like through the ankle joint. So you need to prepare your ankle joint specifically for that stress. It's just like with running. Like if you know you're going to have to run X number of miles in selection, then you should gradually build yourself up to the workload that you know you're going to be finning. I mean, and this is another thing that you guys probably agree with too. I think there's so much information out there now about these courses that if you have the time, I'm of the opinion that like before you go enlist, you should almost be able to meet the graduation standards, um, not just the minimums, because like the information is out there. Like you, you know the answer to the test, and and, re- and realistically, like the evals are the easiest part of the whole program, as as we all know. So it's mm-hmm. from like a confidence standpoint and a stress standpoint, knowing that you can meet those maximums. Like if you walk into the course week one and you know that, like, look, I'm good. I'm not going to fail the eval in week nine as long as I don't quit and I stay healthy that's a huge confidence booster. I mean, I think you're much more likely to kind of doubt yourself and play that mental game. If you're like, well, why am I at the bottom of the pool with a weight belt attached to me tying knots when I'm not going to be able to do 15 pull-ups in two weeks or whatever it is. Right. So 
Like if you know you're going to have to swim X number of meters with fins on and you don't do any fin swimming before you go, yeah, people have made it through doing that. But why, you know, like why, why be, why be harder than you have to, you know, because it's, the course is hard enough. It's designed to break even like the toughest people. So I think there's so much information out there now that you should go in as prepared as possible and shoot for some of those maximums. And fin swimming is a huge part of that. Like, again, you need to be um, efficient enough with freestyle that when you do, you use it as a recovery, you're actually, you know, maximizing that time. But once you reach a certain baseline of freestyle swimming, which you guys could probably speak to better than me at this point, as far as like, you know, time and distance, once you reach that baseline, the, the, the bulk, the majority of your swim training should be with fins on. Right. Agreed. So let me ask you a very pointed question, put you on the spot. When should I do dynamic warm ups or stretches versus static? Just straightforward. Give me, yeah. give me like a short answer. Cause there's, we don't, I only say these things because <laughs> these are the questions short, that we get on Instagram. You, Cause the kids are going to come back at us and be like, okay, I listen to the whole thing, but seriously, like when do I do this one thing? And this one Tell thing. me the black and white answer be, right yeah. now, guys. Yeah. We know you're keeping it from right, us. Well, this, you're right. keeping the one secret. Here's where I'm going to be disappointed. Like, I mean, honestly, do both. And it depends on what, how you personally respond to it. Like, personally, I will do a, a combination of static and dynamic stretching in a warm-up because, like, for me, because I'm naturally kind of like a tight person, for me to get the most out of my dynamic warm-up, I'll have to do some static stuff, you know, prior to that but i mean if you're you know a tend to be more towards like the mobile or like hyper mobile end of things you probably don't need to do static stretching before you train if at all even after and maybe you go right into your dynamic work so unfortunately the answer really depends i, I like i think it's i think i'd be doing the audience a disservice if i said like because the typical answer is do dynamic before and static after and the reason why people say that is because you know, they'll, they'll point to a, a research study that's been taken out of context and they'll say, well, static stretching like makes you weaker, reduces force output. If you actually read those studies, that's why like a lot of times, you know, people like they say science, science says like science doesn't really say anything. We interpret, we interpret scientific studies and there's a whole can of worms involved in what the science actually says. But if you look at the, the studies on static stretching, what they show is that if you, the protocols in these studies will involve like, okay, you want to do a vertical jump. We're going to stretch your hamstrings for like five minutes in a row, which no one ever does a five minute static stretch. Okay. So that you're going to stretch your hamstrings for five minutes and then you're immediately going to do a vertical jump. <laughs> yes. In that situation, you will have reduced force output, reduced explosive power. But, and the caveat to that is, well, what if, what if you're like an athlete that has a 40 inch vertical jump and you static stretch before you play basketball or whatever. Um, and it goes down to 37, which is still really high, but you feel better. And you're like, you can hit better positions. You can get low and play defense, whatever. So in that case, it's actually from a risk reward standpoint, it might be worth it. But the reality is when you, when you do a static stretch, you're not going to go immediately from a static stretch, like seconds later into your activity and most people, like, even if you're doing, let's say, like, a, 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 you're squatting, you might say, okay, I'm going to static stretch, whatever, my hip flexors, my glutes, my adductors to get better depth. But after you static stretch, you're going to do a couple of warm-up sets with light weights, and then you're going to kind of potentiate your nervous system. And at that point, any, like, reduction in force output that you would have had from static stretching is probably going to have been reversed from doing your specific warm-up or your dynamic work. So static stretching, I think, has been vilified. It's not gonna. It's not gonna turn you into a weakling, but if you don't, if you don't feel like you get a benefit from it, then don't do it. But it's not necessarily going to hurt your performance either, because most people aren't doing it long enough to see, get the effects of what some of these studies show. Well, and and I'm a guy that completely connects with that man. Like as you well know, like I have a really serious back, pelvis, spinal injury. I, I haven't gone into it anywhere on these platforms, but if I don't static stretch, like I have to include static stretching because I can't get into those dynamic stretching right. positions or like I have to open my workouts up with a static stretch. I, I tell people all the time, I was never a Lamborghini, but I am 100% a diesel engine now. Like I got man, I got to warm up. Like it takes me a little bit. Like I'm not going to blow anybody away with my speed. 
like with my torque, with my ability to produce power, but I, I like to think I'm a stronger jujitsu player, even for my size, those things, I have to include a mix of static stretching and dynamic stretching. Maybe I came from a different kind of like time frame because like we are all of that generation where you're just like, okay, you just kind of like, you go like this and then you go out on like an yeah. eight mile jaunt. A couple of leg right? swings. Like that's, yeah. yeah. That's it. A couple of leg swings. Like, okay, guys, here's, <laughs> here's what we're going to do and here's where we're going to go. I, I want to talk specifically about injuries though. I have always been a guy where I'm like, all right, listen, if I need an adjunct, if I need a brace, um, that's not like something to keep my, my knee in place from physically dislocating until I can get a surgery. If I don't need wraps, if I don't need, um, specialized anything, I, I would like my body to perform the best that I possibly need it. Cause I may or may not have that stuff out on target. What's the line for you to where people you're like, okay, you have a pathology that you're not addressing, or it might even be a safety blanket. Where do you fall on that continuum of it's okay. And I'm not even, we won't even touch the powerlifting world. Cause that's a whole other conversation about wraps and belts and all this other stuff that I don't want to get into. But when we start talking about, you know, people are like, okay, well, I have to have this, th I have to have this copper bracelet for my forearm or my hand gets tingly when I do long runs, or I have to have these knee braces that a doctor didn't buy for me. But when I buy them, I feel better wearing them. Where's your line for that where, you know, we have a pathology that's causing these symptoms and you're just basically slapping, you know, a, a quick bandaid on it and going on. What would you advise to people that have that one piece of equipment that they just can't even do a training event without? Yeah. I mean, you know what? I I would say that like, look, if it's a situation where like you have, let's say like a legitimately unstable knee pathology in your joint and you need a very like rigid brace to prevent your knee from going into a dangerous position. And it's like that exactly. when you get surgery and you yeah. can't do it, then you have to wear it. Right. That's, sure. a, that's a legit medical reason. But some of this stuff, if it's like, say like a kinesio tape situation or like a, a knee brace that you would get at like, you know, the drugstore, I mean, I don't have a problem with it only because I don't think they do that much anyway. I think that if people get a benefit, it's probably mostly placebo. It's like that, that like piece of styrofoam or whatever it is, neoprene brace that you get at the drugstore, like that's not really stabilizing your knee. It's keeping it maybe a little bit warmer, but it's not, it's not robust enough. It's not rigid enough to actually provide any stability. So, I mean, yeah, in an ideal world, you, you would feel like you wouldn't need anything to, to perform, but like that copper bracelet probably isn't doing shit. You know what I mean? But people, people will wear it and swear by it. So it's like, if it's, if it's a course and you're not allowed to wear it, then, then train yourself to not need it. But if you're, if you're in any kind of a job and like, it allows you to do your job, I would say, sure, go ahead and do it. If you can't wean yourself off it, because it's, if it's working, it's probably not working for the reason that you think, which means that it's not dangerous and it's not a real crutch. I think most people that are wearing this stuff are not wearing things that actually like make that much of a difference. Like if you were to like study it and, and, and try to like separate it from the placebo effect, I don't think these things really do that much anyway. Um, but Brett, Brett Favre told me that it works. Right. I don't know if you know who he is. Yeah, but every single <laughs> cross athlete that, that, that I've ever seen steps How? up with more tape on them to do a set. They're, they're like doing a bench press and they've got tape on calves and they've got like starfish patterns on their shoulder. Like you're telling they're me also sponsored you're by telling too, me that, a lot of them, but yeah, you're telling me that doesn't work. Right. Uh, it looks really cool. It's like I the mean, jewelry. So much, so much of this stuff out. is just so subjective. Right. So it's like when, and when it comes to pain, like, I can't objectively tell you what your pain level is. You, you can, and we all know from, from treating people, you know, like on target, I mean, there are people who've gotten like shot and blown up who at least initially when they're have this high stress response and they don't have the luxury of feeling pain, they don't feel any pain when they probably should. And there are people who like, you can do MRI scans, there's nothing wrong with them and they have chronic pain that debilitates them. So yep. that's why like if someone says, okay, I wore the copper bracelet and it helped, like you can't really tell them that it didn't because you're not in their, in their head. But, um, yeah, I, I think that some of this stuff like is over medicalized and, you know, um, people are, there's a whole industry devoted to finding things that are wrong that aren't really wrong with people and giving them solutions. Um, and if, if people like, want to use that and it makes them feel better, I would say go for it. I don't know if this population is the kind of p population that gravitates towards those things. If anything, my experience with this population is they'll wait until they're like so screwed up to use any kind of an aid where it's like, Hey, mm -hmm. my show. I mean, I, I remember the last deployment that I went on as a PJ during like some of our downtime, 
I would do like some, you know, physical therapy on people. And one of my teammates was like, Hey, can you look at my shoulder? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And like, he literally, I couldn't passively get his arm to go passively, not even him lifting to go above 90 degrees like that in, in abduction or like passively <laughs> go not, above like a hundred degrees of On the like, good, bad scale. And this guy's like doing like free <laughs> fall jumps. He's climbing a rope ladder. He's just an amazing compensator. And I'm like, how long has your shoulder been like this? And he's like, oh, for like, I don't know, years, like 10 years. <laughs> yeah, like, have exactly. You ever, have you ever gotten an MRI? And he goes, no, oh yeah. He goes, oh, he, goes, he goes, yeah, I got it. He was like, um, he was a cop in his civilian job. He's like, yeah, I got an MRI. And they said I need to have a shoulder replacement. And I'm like, yeah, your shoulder is basically effed. I mean, like, this is not a physical therapy solution. Like your joint is, it's like, it's shot. So, and this is a guy that never did anything. You know, maybe he took some Motrin, but like, he wasn't, he wasn't taping it. So this population tends to have the opposite problem where like they wait until something is really bad and they don't want to ever ask for help or use any kind of an aid because they see it as a crutch. Right. So, um, but I think the people that gravitate more towards like the, the braces and the tapes tend to be probably mentally a little bit different than what is successful in, in this line of work. Be careful. I mean, I think you just called a bunch of people mentally weak, but like moving forward, <laughs> <laughs> let's just move on. Yeah. Let's just not focus on it. Can we I mean, edit that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, not, I hear yeah. what I hear and I'm not yeah. that smart. Yeah. Uh, speaking of me not understanding all the medical stuff, let's talk about you for a second. I just read my notes and I just got to it that you were one of the 12 outstanding airmen of the year, which came as a, a surprise to me. What, how did that happen? Was that like an event or something that happened that uh, precipitated you being one of the uh, 12 best airmen in the Air Force that year? Yeah, you had to ask that, didn't you? Um... <laughs> Listen, we've got to, of Brian, all the 12 we've outstanding airmen to. of the years, we have more on this podcast than anybody else in the history of the world. And I'm positive. Joe Rogan still hasn't responded to my earlier call out. I know he listens to the program. I'm going to call him out again. You know what Joe Rogan's never had? Two of the 12 outstanding airmen of the yeah. year. We had we had o- OD on, so he was on, or OB on. Uh, and now you, man. You're our 12 outstanding airmen of the year. Yeah, I mean, this is what I'll say. And look, I, I recognize the importance of military awards and decorations and recognizing people for doing a good job. I think that that like there's there's a role for that. I mean, it's a little bit in our community. I would say it's it was kind of awkward because any time you know when they have the twelve outstanding, there's usually like one PJ and one controller, which makes sense because of the nature of, of those jobs. And I mean, to have been selected like that year and knowing what other people in our career field had. I mean, there was a, a PJ on the the mission that I was on that I presumably got that award for he was a little bit further forward. And while I did more medical treatment, he was probably in more personal danger and was more deserving in some ways than, than I was of the award. So I, I think any PJ would say, look, like these, with these awards, you look at it, like we're all trained at the same level. And a lot of times, like if you're in the right place at the right time and you get the opportunity to do what you were trained to do, you know, then you get written up for, for these awards. And so, like I said, it was awkward because I didn't do anything that like any of you guys wouldn't have done, but I, I mean, the award that, or the, the event that probably was associated with the award was, um, and I'll just kind of go from the citation, not getting into anything like details that are, you know, for OPSEC, but basically there was a mass casualty incident in the Horn of Africa with some partner forces. And there was an IED event with a follow on ambush. And basically, I mean, I literally just did <laughs> March pause on a bunch of people and triaged. And I mean, what was cool about the mission just from like a professional standpoint was that we really got to work with all the, all the tiers of medical care. I mean, there was a forward surgical element and it was really seamless as far as like what the, you know, kind of the guys who were further forward and the ground medics did to the care in the CCP, which is mainly where I was. And then coordinating the, the exfil with the, the surgical team. And because we were kind of forward in a remote place, I was able to do some of the follow on care you know, days later with the, the surgical team. So really cool professional experience. And I mean, even some of those guys that like I'd only work with for that deployment, like I'm still in touch with to kind of come full circle from the beginning of our conversation. But it wasn't, it was anything terribly unique. It was just that like, again, right place, right time. And even as far as PJ missions go, there are probably better, higher profile PJ missions. But, you know, like if we're being honest, like the Air Force also wants to tell a story and they have a particular narrative with some of these awards. And again, I, I understand the, the value of that because I was, I was a guardsman at the time, a traditional, you know, traditional guardsman. 
like right before my deployment was when I had finished physical therapy school and received my doctorate. So from like a kind of a PR standpoint to have like a guy who got his doctorate and then went on this mission as a PJ, it's a good story. Whether or not that makes me or made me an outstanding airman, again, like I don't like necessarily being associated with that because I just feel like there's so many people that are probably more deserving that just for whatever reason, their supervisor didn't write it up a certain way. So um, that was what precipitated the the award. Um, but like I said, I mean, it was it was a cool experience, like to to see what other people in the Air Force are doing because I think that we are very insulated from like what we would call Big Blue. But there's some people in Big Blue that are doing some really cool things that behind the scenes allow you know guys like us to to do our jobs. Um, and you know, just like the way that we were we were treated, I think there was like a a, a genuine um, appreciation for you know, what like the enlisted force does. Um, and like I said, we were treated very well. It was a cool experience to be a part of whether or not like I was deserving of it more than anybody else, especially in our career field. I'm kind of uncomfortable with that, but, um, that, that was kind of the experience. Well, I'll, I'll let you downplay it all you want, man. I know exactly the mission you're on. I know what you did, man, Doug, I'm, I'm proud of you. And you, you lived up to the motto that day. So I'll put it out there for the world to hear. I don't care how you feel about it. Like you're completely deserving. Um, I I've been, it's no, it's no like secret, but you and I deployed together. We were in Balad a decade ago now. Like we were talking about that yep. way, way back in those days and to see where you have gone. Y- yes, we do have a narrative we want to push. Yes. We like, there's, uh, there's a million times we all do it. And we've talked about it, about comparing ourselves to other people. And, and, you know, Kenny said the same thing about, um, him, you know, and the, and the tide, you know, cave rescue. And man, I, I know people personally that were, um, on the UBL raid. And you would never know it. And they would never tell you about it. And they'd be like, well, my job really wasn't that important. I did this one little specific thing. So, man, I'm not comparing you to the the guy that shot Bin Laden. But I'm saying you guys say the same things all the time. And you look kind of like him. So maybe you are the guy that shot Bin Laden. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Can we take this all the way to, to cringy? Like you're already uncomfortable talking about it. Can we just put that out there as well? A bo- no? The book is forthcoming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. So, listen we've been together for a long time, been together, you know, in this career field. And, you know, we're, we're old guys now at this point, like we're guys that are a little bit long in the tooth that have more than a decade in service. There are things that we need to figure out. And luckily engaging with these young lions and these young candidates all the time. Like I, I like to think that I know the, the, the leading edge or some things that I need to change about myself. We came from a very different time. Your in-doc experience was just like mine. It was like, let's just punch you in the mouth. And when the smoke clears, we'll see. It was see harder who, when we who. went through. It was. It was always harder. <laughs> but also, like the, this generation is smarter than us. This generation is better, is better suited than us. This generation has better access to technology. So that our generation, while it was harder, right now to stay relevant, we have to do some things to step forward and step our game up. So where do you think that our generation, like our kind of like grin and bear it, what would your advice be to our generation and be like, Hey, idiots, prioritize these things, do these events to make sure that you're relevant for the next 10 years and not just some broken old guy behind a desk. Yeah, of course. I'm Joe. I mean, every generation says it was harder. The generation now is going to say it was harder. Um, I think ultimately like the career field does a good job of selecting the right people, even if the you know, the script that the selection course changes. Um, so I do have faith in that process. I mean, I would say to answer your, your question, and this, this would go to the new generation too, what you do in selection should not be how you train from a physical standpoint. So for a lot of people, like their initial exposure to structured physical training was at a selection course. And a selection course, the point of it's not necessarily to make you fit. Like I felt like I was more fit and healthier before indoc than after. But if you really think about it, like physical stress, physical and psychological stress, especially through exercise mostly, is a very logistically simple and cheap way to make people uncomfortable that are untrained. So you can't take a bunch of untrained people and, and do simulated PJ missions with them because that would be the real test, right? Like if you're trying to select a PJ, you'd assess their medical skills, their tactical skills, their jumping skills, their communication skills, their rope rescue skills, all those things. You can't do that in untrained people. So you're not going to spend millions of dollars in two years training somebody that you don't think has some of these physical and psychological proxies to do the job. So the point of a selection course is not to necessarily help you develop lifelong habits, training habits for the rest of your career. And and that's why I think that, you know, like 
there's obviously like a little bit of a disparity and there's not a lot of standardization in the human performance programs throughout the career field, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, and, and having guys, you know, like the grin and bear generation, like there's also a fine line because obviously people, they don't want to seem like they're complainers and they don't want, they don't want to seem like they're sandbagging or trying to get out of training events. But at the same time, like if someone has something that's been nagging them, I think they should be able to go to a medical provider that's devoted, that works exclusively at their unit, that they can say, hey, like I'm having some problems. And that person, unless that operator is a harm to himself, is going to keep it relatively confidential and provide, you know, a plan of care so that the operator can go and, and do his job and feel like the problem's being addressed without feeling like he's letting his team down. Because that's always going to be a big burden in this career field. It's like people don't want to seem like they're complaining, so they're not going to get like the seek the care that they need. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'm going to pause you right there. So, so save your space. I want to talk specifically. Like I know that dudes in our career field listening to this podcast. I know you do. I know you're from my peer group. Here's what I want to say directly to you. When those young dudes come to you and they need that help, if you're not on this train, if you're part of those dudes that are like, I can't believe these guys at, at ANS and at prep, get these Google beds and all this stuff. If you're one of those dudes, just do me a favor, shut the F up and help the young guy get the strength that he needs and the conditioning that he needs and the, the input that he needs from these other sources from the entire POTUS staff. If he's coming to you and he's like, I don't know, I feel this way and I need, I need some help to find some holistic remedies for this thing that I got going, just support him. It may sound like nonsense, but guess what? He might be right in 10 years. I'm sorry to derail you there, but I, I hear like, I can just picture a guy come to me and me being the type of dude that I'm just like, what do you need? You want to use essential oils to try to fix your shoulder problem? Let's find you an essential oil salesman, baby. I don't know. Get your tin foil. I'll make a hat too, right? Like finding those ways to get out of your own lane and helping the new generation. The older dudes need to hear this as well. Like don't wait too long. Like it's, it's not appropriate. You can't, don't wait till you're broken to go get fixed. And that applies to mental health. It applies to spiritual wellness. It applies to this holistic thing that we're talking about. Sorry to go on a rant. Doc, back to you. Yeah. And I mean, how many guys, you know, when they leave the career field, even if they didn't do a full 20 years, like leave with some kind of disability where it affects the remainder of their lives, the quality of the remainder of their lives. So, um, I mean, it's a fine line, right? Cause like, it's like an athlete. Are you hurt or are you injured? If you're injured and you can't play amazing quote, are it, you hurt? Or right, I but, ask, I ask dudes that yeah. on target, are you hurt or are you injured? And in either case, like, even if you're, if you're hurt, you can, you can ask to get treatment, but you're not going to like, you're not sitting out training that day. If you're injured, you will. So I think there's a way to kind of to provide adequate care for people and support without babying them. Um, and, and again, like if the selection process does its job, you're not going to get those kind of to people. And I think that like a lot of the, maybe the backlash against ANS and the process now is that there's a lot more work being put in on the front end to prepare people for the selection. But as long as the selection standards don't really change or get lowered like the people that deserve to make it are still going to make it and the ones that don't aren't going to make it because if someone's just not fit for the job you can do all the prep courses in the world they're just not gonna they're not gonna get there but if someone is like has all like particularly like the the teamwork attributes and the psychological qualities but maybe like they're not a great runner or good at push-ups if doing like a you know a five-week prep course and basic training or whatever is going to like get somebody who might be helpful to the career field to pass who otherwise wouldn't I think that's that's a good thing. I, I think like the, the candidates who really don't deserve to make it aren't going to make it no matter how much time and money we throw at this problem, right? So, and, and like no matter how much stuff changes, it, it's always the same. The same kind of people usually make it through as long as the standards stay high. I think that the, you know, like prepping people properly and having a more systematic process is a good thing, especially to develop good habits at the front end, so people know, okay, like I can differentiate between this is selection right now but I also know how to prepare my body and do things smartly. So now when they're not at selection anymore, they have good habits for the rest of their, you know, their career. So that again, human maintenance program, like you want to return on your investment. If you're the air force, if you're a team leader or a team commander, like, do you want guys missing deployments because they're hurt? It's, it's hard to find replacements. And now, you know, now the guy who was going to be home for the birth of his child is not going to be home because someone got hurt. So it affects everybody. It's an ecosystem. 
Yeah. And it's a hundred percent. There's a balance there, obviously, just like anything else, you know, if a person's, you know, bleeding over all the other little things that they're doing into the actual work, because that's what you're here for. And that's what you're prepping for is the mission. So that's a, that's the first thing you gotta know and think of whenever you're prepping for this, if you're prepping so much, or you have to do so many, uh, you know, squats or stretches before you start that it's just bleeding over into your actual mission space, then that's when you go and seek other help outside of just, you know, some kind of scented oil and whatever else. Right. Um, so this is the last, uh, just customary question. Um, you know, just with your experience, 13 years in pararescue, and then also doing the stuff you're doing now, um, you've seen a lot of people that like you were talking about that, um, potentially didn't need a lot of help or some that really did need help and you help them continue and uh, be able to do whatever they do in life um, and continue with that. So for those guys that are training for selection right now, guys and girls, um, or training for anything that's difficult, what would be your best piece of advice for them? You know, mental, physical, whatever kind of uh, advice you got for them to make sure that they are prepared going into something like selection. Well, I think if you're listening to this podcast, that's a step in the right direction. And you guys do a great job with the preparation. I mean, the biggest thing is just, it's going to be stressful no matter what, but it's a lot less stressful if you're prepared. So, you know, any kind of situation is, is, is context dependent. So for example, like I'm not trained to, to fight in the UFC. So people could look at like what I did in the military and say, oh, this guy's like really mentally tough, even though mental toughness is kind of an ambiguous, I think often vague and problematic term. But because I have no training, like a very minimal training in like, MMA, if I had to fight, like right now I weigh 180, if I had to fight the 180 pound champion in UFC with no preparation, I would Murderers, look, I would, you'd get murked, you right. would get killed. I'm sorry yeah. to, to Thank you. derail you, you'd get murdered. But what I'm saying is I would, like my anxiety and my stress response would be much higher in that situation than stepping off the ramp of an airplane at night, or even, even after being out of the military for four years now, like I'd still be much more comfortable right now jumping out of a plane at night, or even it's like, okay, you give me a gun. I've got to walk around a foreign country. If I'm with guys like you that I can trust, like, yeah, you, you're a little, you're a little stress response, but way less than the thing that I'm not prepared for because I spent 13 years doing that job. So like, if you know that you're going to be running, doing a ton of push ups, swimming, and you know, like what the standards are, like if you can meet them, it's a lot less stressful because they're going to do things that you can't predict. And you're not always going to do things under, ideal conditions but if at a minimum you can meet those standards under ideal conditions it just makes the whole process less less stressful right so i mean preparation is key there are some people who i just think like the ones who are like very very gifted and natural where they could do anything not prepare and like they're just so like nothing bothers them and they can do it that like wasn't really me like i i was a little bit more analytical and had to prepare more but unless you're that like really genetically gifted person just like, just, just do the work. Like, and, and the other thing is make sure you really want to do the job. I mean, especially with pararescue, you know, it's not just guys who jump out of airplanes and do cool things. It's like, if you don't want to do the medicine, the technical rescue, like, and we all know people even in, in our line of work who at various points might've said, man, like, I wish we were like doing more, you know, direct action and stuff like that. So, well, why did you be a PJ? Because, <laughs> you know, like, I'm not saying that there aren't guys yeah. in the career field who do that, but but that ain't what we do, homie. Right. Like, if you if you want to direct action, there's a, there are three battalions right now. Two of them on the east coast, one of them out west. Those guys do nothing but direct action. Yeah, and, they're called the Rangers. Yep. And it's a real. I mean, it's it's not just like it's not it's not a workout club either. Like some, I think some guys like want to do the job because they want to prove like how kind of tough they are and like I can make it through the training. But the job isn't about like it's not selection. Like the the there's actually like a job after that. And, um, even all the cool things you do, like jumping out of planes and diving, that's just a way to get to work, but it's, it's like, it's a serious job and it's got consequences. And you're also like seeing people on their worst day. Um, so just make sure like, that's really what you want to do. Cause I think ultimately the people that like really want to do it are the ones who make it through as long as they have like a baseline level of athleticism, then it comes down to like, if you really want to do it, you'll do it. Um, if you don't, yeah. then you won't. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, we tell people that all the time is just having the bandwidth to think 
because you have that foresight, you've had the preparation to physically be prepared. That gives you that extra bandwidth to actually be able to think. And um, yeah, I think that's super important for guys. And then obviously, you know, knowing your why and what you're doing there in the first place. And that's one of the main reasons that we have this podcast in the first place. We've been interviewing, you know, a SEAL, Green Berets, you know, Coast Guard, rescue swimmers and everybody just so if guys are going to go into whatever career field they want to go into, they got to know full, you know, full speed. This is what I'm going to do. And this is why I'm doing it. This is what I, you know, plan on doing. This is the mission of these people. And this is why I believe in it. So, you know, mission of power rescue men obviously is to bring home people not to kick indoors, not to do any of that kind of stuff and shoot people in the face and do any of that kind of stuff. If you want to do that, go for Rangers straight up. Um, all right. So thanks again for coming on and for you guys that were listening, you know, we mentioned the links a lot in this, uh, podcast. So we'll have those available for you guys. Um, we'll kind of just section them off based on the topics that we were talking about and those topics that we were talking about. I remember, you know, Doug has helped train guys that were in pretty much any professional, um, sports association, like the MLB, NBA, X games, all those other kinds of professional sports. He's helped those people rehabilitate and, um, you know, get back to the game that they got to play. Um, and in this case, this is going to be training for you guys. So specific things that we talked about were shin splints. I know everybody deals with them. And he just talked about a lot of the variances and ways that you might get shin splints and some of the things that you can do. Mainly, um, altering your stride is uh, one of the biggest things that he was talking about to make sure that you prevent yourself from getting injured, specifically from shin splints. Obviously, we'll put some links in there for that. And then uh, rucking, Aaron was talking about some of the stuff that he's done with the baton death march and the pains that he's gone through and us not knowing, you know, any of the physical therapy things, including, you know, Doug talking about when he was going through and he was not having difficulty with treading and that kind of stuff. So obviously we would have loved this knowledge earlier in our lives and we could have done the prevention, uh, you know, that was necessary to stop us from, you know, becoming hurt, becoming slow, becoming, you know, ineffective at treading or not even rucking is good. So you know, make sure you guys are studying up on those things because it will pay dividends whenever you actually go. It might not feel like it, um, right now because you, like we were talking about before, are able to regenerate much more quickly than you will in another five, 10 years. Um, but if you put in the work to make sure that you're, you know, stretching every night before, after dynamic versus static, all that kind of stuff, like we were talking about, um, you will actually feel that benefit, you know, as you have that longevity throughout your career versus those people like us that weren't, that didn't have the knowledge to be able to do that kind of stuff. So that's why we're uh, doing this podcast right now. I really appreciate you, Doug, coming on, um, you know, as our second 12 outstanding airmen of the year. Um, I had to throw it in there again, but no, it's a leader, baby. It's We've awesome. Got more yeah. than everybody else. A hundred percent more. Yep. Boom. You got to get that $300 million Spotify deal now, like Rogan, right? <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, when he responds to me, I'm telling you, he listens, Joe, I know you're listening. I can't beat you in jujitsu. You're a black belt. But our podcast is coming for you, son. Yeah, because you're going to be on it. All right. So... <laughs> Um, you know, again, we want to thank you guys for listening. If you guys ever have any questions or if you want to reach out, um, can they hit you up at your uh, web, your website and your, uh, email address? What would be the optimum yeah, so the easiest way? Channel? Um, our websites, resilientperformance.com and then social media, our Instagram handles, resilient PPT. So for resilient performance, physical therapy. And then I, I'm quite the tweeter. Um, so my Twitter handle is actually Greenfeet PT. It's probably the one that I'm the most active on. But yeah, Instagram, Twitter, and then our, our website are probably the best ways. Awesome. Yeah, we support everything you're doing. Um, yeah, go check him out on Instagram. Make sure you hit him up with any questions that you got. Obviously, um, you know, he has a, a clinic and all that other stuff, two different businesses to run in two different locations and everything like that. So give him a little bit of time to, to respond. But uh, hopefully this helped you guys out. If you're experiencing any of these difficulties, obviously you can always hit us up also on any questions that you have over on Instagram or info at ones ready. And make sure that you like, subscribe over on YouTube. Give us five star review. We appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to us and we hope that it really helps so thanks again we'll see you guys next time you go out there and earn each breath Bye. yeah thank you and our thanks god that was great brought back some good memories <laughs> <laughs>